All right. Um, I, I have discovered that if you give your class a week off, people forget that they come to this class. We're, we're old and we have senior moments. And where was I going with Oh, Yeah, that's right. Too late. So this past weekend, uh, I got a, well, I got a phone call last week. And uh, this past weekend, I was able to drive to Winters, Texas. Anybody know Winters? Have you heard me talk about Winters? I know that you guys know where Winters is. It's about 41, 42 miles south of Abilene. You've got to have heard of Abilene. Okay. And they asked me to come down there and preach for them, which is, you know, I forced myself to accept that invitation. <laughs> and tried to keep the saliva off my mouth. I was just drooling at the idea. So Debbie Bowman told me she'd be here tonight, but I don't see her, so I can talk about her freely. <laughs> I picked her up at the airport uh, yesterday, I believe, and on the way home, I was telling her about my trip to Winters and how I got an opportunity to preach there and how, how special that was and how much I enjoyed it. And she said, don't, don't you do that every Wednesday? <laughs> I guess, yeah, I kind of do, so, yeah. But it was still special. Uh, when I was in grad school many years ago, I worked with that church for two and a half years. I was primarily the youth minister and song leader, if you can believe that. But then when they were between preachers, I got to preach for about five months. I mean, it was a baptism of fire for me, but it was very, very good experience. And uh, believe it or not, there are still some people who are alive who knew me back in 19, no, what, what, what would you do? 73, hey, no laughing. 71? Well, I went there in 71 and left in 73, yes. And there were still some they were really old people <laughs> who were still alive. And I thought, how's that? Fourth place. Oh, John. Okay, John, you completely destroyed my train of thought. And I will use that as an excuse for the rest of the night. Thank you very much for doing that. Hey, he shot the 89, not me. You want the mic? <laughs> A muzzle, not yeah, a muzzle, a muzzle. In chapter 9, when Jesus was debating the Pharisees, I get, no, excuse me, it was, it was in chapter 8, when Jesus was debating the Pharisees, the name of Abraham came up a number of times. It is really the thing, the name that kind of ties the whole chapter together. And Jesus kind of puts a cap on that discussion about Abraham by saying, and you'll remember this, I know, Paula, are you ready to, to finish this sentence? Before Abraham was, I am. I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And you tell me I have to, I have to go with ego and me. Remind everybody what it is in the Greek. That's good. Now, John is famous for his famous seven I am statements. We've had two of them so far. Do you remember? After the feeding of the 5,000, what do you think it might be? That's it. I am the bread of life. And when he was Healing the blind man, he said, I am the light of the world. We're going to have two more I am statements tonight in this one section of verses 1 through 21 of chapter 10. Now, I, for you who got the notes that had chapter 9 and didn't open the one that I sent with the, you know, Paula just, she's just so busy yeah. these days that she doesn't have time for trivial things like proofreading my notes or things like that. So I sent out chapter 9 by mistake, plus it had several other mistakes in it, but we're not going to mention whose fault that was. Uh, what are the 
the two I am's tonight. The gate. I'm running. Uh oh. This is a bad sign when my marker goes away. And the good shepherd. So we have three more to come. Two of them will be in chapter 11, I believe. I am the resurrection and the life. And I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then in chapter 15, I am the vine. So those are the seven I am statements in John. But the critical one is before Abraham was, I am. It was so critical. What was the reaction of the Jews? Do you remember? What, what did they do? That they went home and told their wives about Jesus? What? No. They picked up stones to stone him to death. They were so incensed by Jesus saying before Abraham was, I am. Because they knew it as a claim to be God. And they reacted accordingly. All right. So Jesus introduces this new thought. And he talks about shepherd and sheep on and off. But really all the way through the chapter. But especially in the first 21 verses of, of the chapter. And, and you have to see what he says in these verses in light of the conflict that he has had now on several different occasions with the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees too, they're in there, with the Jewish leaders. Because he healed a man by the pool, told him to carry his bed home, but it was the Sabbath, and he got into conflict with the Jews. And then he healed a man by telling him to wash his eyes in the pool of Siloam, and he got into conflict with the Jews. And chapter 8, my goodness, it's nothing but conflict. So Jesus gently disguises what he thinks of the religious leaders by talking about the shepherd and the sheep. And that's going to be our theme tonight. And I told Paula, you know, usually it's basically just a study of John, but I have several places in the Bible that I want to look at tonight. Uh, by the way, I, I nearly always try to put these in parentheses in the text. Is there anybody who, who says, gee, I wonder what that passage says and turns over to that passage? Okay, well, I'll continue to do it anyway because it's good practice for me, so that's all right. Now, the shepherd and the sheep. That image has a rich history in the Old Testament. What is the famous passage that we all know about the shepherd and the sheep? Psalm 23. Pardon me? Psalm 23. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. And in the Old Testament, for the most part, God is always thought of as the shepherd. So by even making this claim that I am the good shepherd, he is essentially reinforcing the idea that he has said on other occasions of being God, God in the flesh. But we can't get to the good shepherd until we talk about a couple of other things um, that Jesus says first. He says, first of all, go ahead, Paul, would you pass those on, please? Mm -hmm. you might, I don't care which end you start at. I, I printed a picture of something, I want to, I've, I've got enough to pass down the row after you see it, and this is going to cause a stir. I know, I'm sorry, but you probably don't need this, but it is a picture of a typical uh, sheep pen that uh, would have been in existence in the first century. In fact, is in many places still in existence today. After you've seen it, if you would pass it down. Yeah, it's yeah, it's not one for everybody, Ada. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, pass it down after you've looked at it. I want you to get this picture of what a sheep pen looks like. And the thing that I want you to notice most of all is how narrow, small the opening is. Okay? It needs a gate. 
But instead of having one that is on hinges, Jesus says, I am the gate or I am the door. Sometimes it's translated. But in terms of the shepherd and the sheep, I think a gate makes uh, makes more sense. Now, he says that he is the one that controls the going out and the coming in. Because he's the gate. And he said, because I'm the gate, the people who are mine will go in and out and find pasture for themselves. He will always know if the sheep are going in or the sheep are coming out because he is the gate of the sheep pen. He keeps track. But in so doing, he's also claiming what I would call exclusive. If I could say it, it would be helpful. Exclusive. Yeah. Exclusive. I, Paula, don't let me drink before I come here. I, I cannot handle it. Exclusivity. Hey! He is claiming exclusivity. And by that I mean he is claiming that he is the one in charge of who gets in and who gets out. And if you think that's a misinterpretation, you've got to remember that Jesus is going to continue that for the rest of the, that, that theme for the rest of the gospel. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What follows that? Do you remember? Nobody comes to No one. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Now listen. You are either the most arrogant human being that ever walked the earth to say that or you are God's representative, God in the flesh. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus says. Now, we, because we've been in the class, remember that back in John chapter 1 in the first few verses, it says clearly in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was was God. He was with God in the beginning. That's why he can claim this kind of exclusive control, power of letting people in or not letting them in because he is the gate. That is the, uh, the third I am statement. I am the gate. Um, <coughs> You mentioned Psalm 23 as the famous passage about God being the shepherd. One of my favorite, and I put it in your notes, is Isaiah 40 and verse 11. Isaiah 40 and verse 11. This is the prophet Isaiah speaking to the people in exile and telling them that life is going to get better for them. And listen how he puts it. He, God, tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. And he gently leads those that have young. And that phrase, that have young, might mean those who are with young, pregnant. So those sheep that are about to, you know, it's hard for them to get around. And so that the Lord takes special care of those. And this picture of the shepherd picking up the lambs and holding them close to his ark and carrying them is a beautiful sight. And Isaiah is predicting that God is going to find a way to bring his people back to the land and he will make sure they get there because he will provide for them the way a shepherd provides care and leading for the sheep. That's Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 11. Ray Steadman, who I try to read nearly every week, writes this. The Pharisees considered shepherds to be unclean, unworthy to enter the temple or even to know God. And those rich and sophisticated Greeks and Romans detested shepherds because of the smell, but also considered them vulgar. Ironically, Jesus uses this image to instruct and convict, convict the pious frauds, as well as to model to the good leaders how they should be. Now remember how the religious leaders have acted toward Jesus and how they have acted toward the people of Israel. 
Jesus is trying to say there is a better way for the leaders of the of God's nation to uh, to act in a better a better way for them to take care of the people. Now, being called a sheep is probably not the most flattering thing that you can be described as. How many of you have any context for the dealing with sheep? Anybody ever work with sheep? Saw a picture of a sheep? <laughs> You're there then. Yes, something that wool dress, beautiful, yes. Or a wool coat. Yeah, that's your experience with the sheep. Let me tell you about sheep in case you don't know this. And, 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 and please don't call the SPCA on me. Sheep are dumb. Have you ever seen trained sheep, you know, now he's going to jump through this hoop. Watch this, roll over. Sheep are not very intelligent animals. I'm just telling you the facts. And so, you know, we're sheep. And in this context, I think it means too often we don't understand enough about life to be in charge of life for ourselves. We're like the sheep, we're kind of... And sheep are dirty. Sheep are dirty. I don't know how that fits with us. And thirdly, sheep are helpless. Have you ever gone up to a yard and seen a sign that says, beware of sheep? <laughs> sheep? Sheep really don't have any way of hurting people. If they're ever attacked, do you know the only thing they can do? Run. That's all. That's, they've got nothing to fight back with. They're not an armadillo that has a shell. They're not a porcupine that can stick people. They've got nothing. They are defenseless. They are helpless. So they're dumb and they're dirty and they're helpless and they're us. We are the sheep in all of this. Once again, Ray Steadman. Sheep is a metaphor for God's people, although sheep are notoriously stupid animals. See, I didn't make that up. And can't survive on their own. They show us that without God, we are just like them. They are totally dependent upon their caregiver, the shepherd. A sheep that gets out and lives on its own will starve because it will not go where the food is. That's why it says... He leads me to green pastures because sheep will not find it on their own. It will hurt itself by rubbing itself to death on a tree or falling down and breaking its leg or falling off a cliff. Sheep need constant care and attention and the sheep that skips out on that care will die. The shepherd is the one who graciously cares for the sheep in his care even laying his life on the line against predators and rustlers. So in that picture you saw of a typical sheep pen with the opening, the shepherd lays there, not just so the sheep can't get out, but so that no awful animal can get in. And if one approaches and is especially hungry, the shepherd will fight him even if it costs him his own life. And that, of course, is going to pl pl play a very important role in the metaphor that Jesus develops here in this, in this episode. Now, the Lord is my shepherd, David says, but the title of shepherd, and by the way, I put it in my pocket. This is not going to, this is not going to work. I bet I can't, okay. I want you to remember this word. This will be on the final, you can be sure. <laughs> I just lost four students. Yeah. <laughs> Poimain. 
Poimen, it's the way it's pronounced. This is actually an ada in Greek, not an e, and an ada is long. Poimen. And it's translated shepherd. Nearly every time in the New Testament, this word is translated as shepherd except once. And just wait. I'll tell you where that is and what it has led to, okay? So, when we read, I am the good shepherd, he is the good poimain, Jesus says. When he talks about the shepherd who is willing to lay down his life for the sheep, he is talking about what the poimain is willing to do. I hope that you will try to remember that word. Now, in the Old Testament, the local officials of the nation of Israel were called the shepherds of the flock. Yes, God is the chief shepherd, so to speak, but under him, under him are designated shepherds who are meant to provide care and leadership for the nation of Israel. Now, why would you suppose that God would make sure that they would have such a title? So that they would understand what their responsibilities were. They were shepherds of the people. They saw the kind of care which a shepherd gave to the sheep, and God says, that's the kind of care I want you to give to the people of the nation of Israel. Some of the leaders of Israel took that very seriously. And some did not. There are, unfortunately, several prophetic passages in the Old Testament where the prophets of God take the shepherds to task for what they've been doing. I'm going to read one of them. There are many of them. This is Ezekiel 34. He not only saw the valley of the dry bones, he saw this. Listen. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. In other words, this is not my opinion, Ezekiel says. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? Oh, you eat the curds, you clothe yourselves with the wool and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have brought back, nor have you brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. I'm reminded of the parable that Jesus told in Luke 15. Maybe you've thought about it. There were 99 sheep, and one was lost. What did the shepherd do? He searched and searched and searched until he found that one lost sheep. God says, speaking through Ezekiel, my people were scattered too. And you went, oh, that's really a shame. And you didn't show them the kind of care that sheep often get from shepherds. You just let them go. And then I want to read to you because it contains right near the end this an illusion about the good shepherd. It's Isaiah 53. Many of you have heard these words. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and the punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds, we are healed. And here come the words. We all like sheep 
have gone astray. We have turned each one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, because we're dumb and dirty and helpless, we need something, we need someone to do something for us. God says, that's going to happen. There is one coming, and all of your sins we will lay on him. I know you have all gone astray, but I've got a plan to take care of that. And I think that Jesus is adopting that idea. He's accepting that for his own from that prophecy in, the, in contrast to these leaders who were only concerned about themselves. Um, he compares them to hired hands. You know what a hired hand is, right? That's somebody who say, I'll give you, well, in those days, no. I'll give you $12 an hour to sit here and watch these sheep. Okay. Uh-oh. Here comes the wolf. Excuse me. He's gone. Why? He's a hireling. He gets paid by the hour. He doesn't have a vested interest in the sheep. He doesn't care about the sheep. He cares about his $12 an hour, but he's not about to fight a wolf for $12 an hour, and he gets out of there. Jesus said, that's what you're like. You're, you're hirelings. You really don't have any use for the sheep whatsoever. I think this is an indictment on the Jewish leaders that he had been in conflict with. Remember we talked about the conflict? Listen, the lame man by the pool for 38 years, is there any indication that anybody in leadership had tried to help him? No! And the man who was born blind, that all he could do is sit on the side of the road and beg, did anybody of the leaders help? No! And then, and then, when they were helped, the shepherds of Israel just went, wait a minute, this is the Sabbath. <laughs> they didn't rejoice with him. They tried to find some reason why this shouldn't have happened. They tried to find some reason why it didn't happen. They demonstrate clearly that they have no real care for the people of Israel, just in these two examples, but clearly... That was the way they approached government. Now, we have some sheep raisers in Texas, and normally they have dogs to do the herding of the sheep. Have you ever seen sheep dogs work? They're pretty amazing. They're pretty amazing. What they do is they get behind the sheep and they run so fast you can hardly see them move, and if some sheep is loitering, just give him a little bite on the heel and he'll catch up. But there's a difference between sheep herding and shepherding. Shepherds don't drive their sheep from behind. They take their staff and they walk out in front of the sheep. And usually they call them. Many of the shepherds I've come to understand have this instrument that's not unlike a pan flute, okay? And in the way they play it, the sheep know that that's their shepherd because they hear the tune. Some of them, you know, play Silence is Golden and some. <laughs> we're they all could be California girls, but whatever song it is. Can you imagine that song on the pan flute? No, I can't even, okay. But the sheep recognize either the voice of the shepherd or the instrument that he plays because they're used to it. And I know you've heard this illustration before, but it's true that sometimes in that sheep pen that you saw, there might be two flocks and they go in there at night. The next morning, one of the shepherds gets up and begins to call or play his flute and he will walk off, and you know what happens? The sheep who belong to him follow him out, and the ones who remain belong to the other shepherd. That is how they herded sheep back then. They didn't need dogs. One of the differences, I think, is that 
I think most sheep today are raised for their meat. I'm not saying all. But in the first century, most of the time the sheep were kept for their wool. And, and, and the shepherds made a long-term investment in, it, in the sheep so that every year or every six months they would be able to harvest the wool from the sheep. And it was in their best interest if the sheep stayed healthy. They weren't about to send them to market every two years and then start over with some new, a new flock. They had a vested interest in that flock and that relationship may last for a long time. Um, I had a preacher friend of mine who was in Israel a number of years, many years, oh gosh, many years ago. And he was on a tour bus and the guy up at the front with a microphone was explaining, they were in sheep country and he was explaining how these shepherds tend their flocks and how they lead their flocks. And they says, they never mistreat the sheep. They lead the sheep. They love the sheep. They know the sheep by name. There's old Black Ear. There's old Limpy. And out the window, they saw a guy with a stick beaten on some sheep. And somebody in the bus says, I thought you said shepherds never did stuff like that. And he said, that's not the shepherd. That's the butcher. These sheep had been sold, and this is the way the butcher treated them. He had no vested interest in them. He had no love for those sheep. He didn't know what their names were. All he knew was that they were going to make somebody's dinner better. Those, that's not a shepherd. That's the butcher. So it says in verse 6 in chapter 10 that when he was talking about this, when he used this figure of speech, they didn't understand what he was telling them. In other words, you know, I, I told you at the beginning, you may not remember, I said there aren't any real parables. But this is a metaphor, I believe, and it's the closest thing to a parable we find in John. And the people went, What's, what's all this stuff about sheep? I, 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 don't, I don't really get it. So Jesus is going to speak more specifically and clearly about that. Uh, as I said, he says in verses 9 and 10, let's read those together. I am the gate, whoever enters uh, through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. And then he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full or abundantly. I mean, I have come that they may have, this is the best way, life. Not existence, life. Do you remember when we talked about John stating his purpose in John chapter 20, 30 and 31? If y'all are going to memorize anything, let's say, oh, you said, well, the prologue's too long, I can't remember. You can memorize 30 and 31 of chapter 20. In fact, I may call on you, one of you, in two weeks. <laughs> Paula, there will be four people in class. Yeah, Apparently, they won't yeah. come. <laughs> no, I won't do that. No, no, it's not a threat. It says, Jesus performed many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. He wants them to know that by putting their confidence in the Good Shepherd, it will not only mean heaven, salvation, it will mean a life that is fuller and more abundant than anything they can have without it. Now, I want to say a word about that, a word of caution probably. Because every once in a while on TV, I hear that scripture quoted, 
And it's in the context of you will get the best, highest paying job because you are a Christian. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. And that means pocketbook. It does not. It does not mean that. When you find in the book of Acts especially, those folks who were most dedicated to the Lord had the most difficult life in the... Well, I didn't do that. And the fewest coins in their pocket. Even Jesus said, you know, Foxes have holes, birds have nests. I got squat. That's in the Greek. You'll have to trust me on that. <laughs> the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus was homeless, except for the places where his friends and his disciples lived, and he could stay with them, like Mary, Martha, and Lazarus that we will see before this semester is over. Having abundant life means having a sense of purpose, having a sense of security, having a sense of that no matter what this world brings against us, we have the resources to deal with it out of our relationship to Jesus Christ. That's what it means to have life abundantly. We don't have to live in paucity and scarcity spiritually. Scarcity spiritually, we have abundance. And that's what Jesus is saying here. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it to the full. The fullest life you can have, Jesus says, is to put your trust and your confidence in me because I am the good shepherd. Read with me verse 11. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, <laughs> he's not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep. And he runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. And the man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I, he repeats it again, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. That intimacy there, that's what I have with my disciples. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Now see, he has already intimated that a good shepherd is willing to lay down his life for the sheep, but he now carries it a step further. He begins to intimate that that is about to happen. He is going to be laying down his life for the sheep. Skip verse 16, because we'll talk about that in a minute. Verse 17, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Now, when we get to the story near the end of the gospel of Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, when the troops come for him, they all think that they're in charge. And they're not. They are part of God's ultimate plan to deal with our problem. Don't, don't think, oh, poor Jesus, look, he's, he's not helpless. In fact, how many of you know the song he could have called 10,000 Angels? You all know that yes. song? It's a great song. And he could have. But he didn't. He said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. I'm the shepherd who lays down his life for the good of the sheep. Okay. And then he says twice, and I have the power to take it up again. Hinting ever so subtly, at the resurrection. Now, besides the crowd, the twelve are surely here and listening to this. Did they get that? No. When they went to the tomb on the first day of the week, they weren't there to witness the resurrection. Oh boy, it won't be long now. They brought spices. 
their dear beloved teacher was dead and they were going to make it as good as they possibly could with spices. But Jesus says, I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. Now, Oh, Paul, it's going to be an early night. Poor Paul is not here tonight. Paul is my timekeeper, and he always gives me a hard time, but we'll, we'll have an early night in Paul's honor. Not real early. I still got stuff I want to talk about. Backing up to verse 16, and he just kind of subtly says this. Did you notice? There's no fanfare. He just kind of subtly, yeah, who turned the page? Okay, I did. I can't even blame this on Paul. <laughs> I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. I believe that Jesus is laying the groundwork here for what is going to happen in the book of Acts. You remember when the the church first begins, it is a strictly Jewish church. I mean, they're all of that flock. And then Philip the evangelist goes up into Samaria and causes a stir up there by baptizing a bunch of people and bringing them in. And they said, woo, Samaritans. Well, okay, okay, they're kind of Jewish. <laughs> but then the church at Antioch of Syria their whole evangelism structure is to Gentiles, and the Gentiles begin to flock into that church. It becomes the most dynamic large church in the whole brotherhood in Antioch, and it's almost completely made up of Gentiles. Jesus says, I've got sheep that are not of this sheep pen, and I'm going to call them. And you know what? They'll hear my voice. They'll know my voice, and they'll be mine. There'll be one shepherd and one flock. Now, I don't know if that sermon was preached very often in the early church, but it should have been. It should have been brought to the disciples' attention that the Lord's plan was always to bring the sheep together so there's one flock and one shepherd. I think that's what verse 16 is really all about. Now, once again, what he says causes division among the Jews. You've noticed that. Verse 19. At these words, the Jews were again divided. Many of them said, he's demon-possessed. He's raving mad. <clears throat> why listen to him? Now, why would they conclude that? I am the good shepherd. You know, come on. That's what they said. But there was another opinion. These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. And besides that, can a demon open the eyes of the blind? You see how chapter 10 is connected to chapter 9. Many of the people who are listening to what he says on this occasion are very aware of the fact that he has just opened the eyes of a man who was born blind. And as the blind man said, that hadn't happened in all the history of men. There's never been a record of anybody being cured of blindness who was born blind. And yet you say, gee, we don't know where he comes from. These are not the sayings of a man who's crazy. And besides that, can a crazy man, can a demon-possessed man open the eyes of the, blind, of the blind and they were divided? No. I told you I was going to look at other stuff in the Bible because there's a couple of other points that I want to make. They're not really directly related to John 10. If I admit that, it's okay, Paula. But I, this is a perfect spot, I think, for me to talk about them a little bit. First of all, other New Testament writers refer back to this idea of Jesus being the good shepherd. And I noted the passages for you there in your notes, 1 Peter 2, 23 to 25. I want to read this. He says, when they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross 
so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. For by his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So Peter is expressing something very personal to the folks that he's writing to. Don't forget what Jesus did, what, but, but, but why he did it was because that is amazing. <laughs> Try not to do that again. Because you were like sheep who had gone astray, but now, but now, you've come back to the shepherd. And Peter reminds them that Jesus is that shepherd. And then the other one um, is, in, is in Hebrews. Did I note that? No. Yes, yes, Hebrews 13. I, it's 20 and 21, but I'm only going to read 20. And this is the benediction at the end of Hebrews. Now, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. Jesus, long after he left this earth, continued to be known as the shepherd of God's people, the good shepherd, the one who lays down his life for the sheep. Now, Here's a part that's off a little, but I want you to know it anyway. You're probably aware that the term shepherds is the term that church leaders adopted in the first century. That's very appropriate that the church is kind of seen as the new Israel. And just as Israel was governed by shepherds, so the early church was also governed, looked after, tended to by people who were called shepherds. Here's what we read in Acts chapter 20. Paul was on his way back to Jerusalem. And he really wanted to stop at the church at Ephesus, but he thought, if I go there, you know, they'll want to serve me Sunday dinner for six weeks. I don't have that much time. So he called for the elders of the church to meet him in a town called Miletus. This is Acts 20. If you were in my Acts class, this is all old hat to you. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. He calls to them to meet him in Miletus, and this is what he says. And picture the scene, it's down on the beach, and he kneels, kneels with them together on the beach. Now I know, that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you <laughs> overseers. That word is sometimes translated bishops, by the way. The Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Listen, be shepherds of the church of God. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. For I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So, be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Paul sees the danger. The danger is going to be from without and the danger is going to be from within. If the flock is going to survive and do well, they will need good what? Shepherds. shepherds. They will need shepherds who care so much about the flock that they will do anything to make sure that nothing bad happens. I want you to do that. And by the way, shepherd the church of God. The word is poimain. Not surprisingly. In fact, well, one more. 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4. You know what? Yeah, 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder 
and the witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Okay, he's addressing the elders who are called shepherds as well in Acts 20. He's addressing them and he says, these shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. Listen, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Did you get a feel for the kind of leadership that God is looking for in his kingdom? Not lording it over the flock. You know what that means? Look, I'm in charge here. I've been an elder for 22 years and you will do what I say. That's lording it over the flock. Don't do that. Instead, be a what? Example. Be an example. Show them the way a Christian life is supposed to be lived. That's your real authority. They see you living like Jesus wants you to live, and that is the prime source of your authority. And don't do it because you feel like you have to. Do it because you feel like that's what God has called you to do to serve in His kingdom. And don't be pursuing dishonest gain but be eager to serve, eager to serve, because sheep are dumb and dirty and helpless. If you're going to be a shepherd, you be oh, I forgot, and work, work to serve the flock. That's what they need. Now, once again, shepherd, poime. Okay, here's a little thing that you probably won't care about, but since I do, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> and and I think I think I think I gave you the wrong Paula had the wrong chapter, I uh -huh. think, in in Ephesians. <laughs> it's not Ephesians five, it's Ephesians four. Paula, don't make that mistake again. Yes. <laughs> it's in yes. Ephesians four, verses eleven and twelve. And the context is Paul talking about how the church came to be gifted with the different forms of leadership that it enjoys. He says, It was Christ himself who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So what? Okay. You have your apostles, your prophets, evangelists, and then you have your pastors and teachers. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. sure. That's the word for pastor in Ephesians 4. Listen to me. You can draw your own conclusions from this, but you need to know it. It is the only time in the New Testament that the word poimain is translated anything but shepherd. And you say, well, then why do they translate it pastor? I don't know. But what has happened is it has created a whole new office in the church. Do you have shepherds in your church? Yes, we do. And we have a pastor, too. That's what I want you to see. Like I said, whatever you do with that information is just up to you, but you need to know that. For some reason, they decided to make the word pastor, and now every church has a pastor, and most of them have shepherds beside. But biblically speaking, that's the same thing. Or as my Norwegian father used to say, it's the same thing. <laughs> he did. That's what he did. Okay. So I wanted you to know that. Um, I, I don't have a big problem with people being pastors, but I want you to understand that biblically, 
biblically speaking. Elders, shepherds, pastors, overseers are all the same thing. Biblically. Now, if you have a problem, I've got a paper that I wrote that's about 18 pages long on that if you'd like to read it. So far, no hands, Paul. I, I, I'm, I'm a little disturbed by that. But I, I, I did that for a graduate class in college, but that's, that's the truth. Just to say a few words about today's shepherds in the church. You shouldn't, you shouldn't seek any leadership role in the church for its benefits. No, I'm not talking about a 401k. <laughs> not that kind of benefit. I'm talking about the idea that, well, you'll be looked up to and you'll get to go to the front and, you know. A friend of mine who was a preacher told me this one time. He said, sheep will always need much more than they provide. Think about that. Sheep will always need much more than they will provide. A shepherd doesn't work out a deal with the sheep. Here's what I'll do for you. I'll take care of you and then you can... What? So if you decide that you want to be in the shepherding business in a local congregation, make sure that your motivation for doing that is because you want to find special ways to care for the sheep. Anything else, Jesus says, is just like those guys in the first century that really were only interested in themselves. There's just no, no legal, selfish reason to want to be a leader in the church other than the fact that you want to take care of the flock. Final words. If someone said to you, how do you know who's qualified to be an elder or a shepherd in the church today? You can say, well, you know what? If you look at 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, in both of those places, there's a list of the kinds of characteristics that shepherds are supposed to have. You know, one of them is not, he's not given to a lot of wine. I know that lets a lot of people <laughs> I'm standing over here. That lets a lot of people out, you know. No, he should, I love this, he shouldn't be a brawler. <laughs> Say, did you hear the shepherd got into a brawl last night with Hank? No, no, that's not the kind of guy that we're looking for. So you can read those characteristics and say, okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense, that makes sense. But let me tell you, what the most important qualification of an elder slash shepherd slash pastor is. You won't find this in the Bible. This is me. They smell like sheep. <laughs> <laughs> Not literally. Do you know why shepherds smell like sheep? They're because they're with the sheep. They are with the sheep. They are seeing to the sheep's needs. They are watching for what, they're watching that the sheep don't get in danger. They spend time with the sheep. Too many churches are run by a board who meet behind closed doors and then come out and tell the people what they're supposed to do. I just don't think that's the kind of leadership that Jesus wants in his church. He wants people who get in there with the sheep. And I remember preaching one time. We were about to appoint new elders slash shepherds in our church. And I said, I'm going to be looking for somebody who is already doing the work. I'm going to be looking for someone who spends his time with the sheep, who demonstrates demonstrates real care for people who are in need, who doesn't just turn his back on someone whose life has run amok. He is in there to provide whatever help that he can. That's the kind of person that I would want to be a shepherd. Because you see, if you take someone who has a 
a board of directors kind of mentality and then tell him he's supposed to be a shepherd, he'll be lost as a goose. He won't know even how to do that. He's never done that. Well, I, I guess you could tell me a problem if you really wanted to. You know. Am I sounding too harsh, Paul? <laughs> well, truthful. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. So, the most important quality in a good shepherd is he smells like sheep. He is there with the people. And when you read how Jesus lived his life while he was here on the earth, not only does he spend time with the disciples, but he spends time on people who are, well, you might call outcasts. You know one of the main criticisms of Jesus that he spends his, he spends his time with sinners? Jesus said, well, let me just say this about that. It's not the well who need the doctor, it's the sick. <laughs> I've not come to call well people, I've come to call sick people. Of course I'm going to be there with the people who need me. And he developed this relationship with people. He called people by name. He called Nicodemus Nicodemus. He called Zacchaeus Zacchaeus. He called these people because he had a vested interest in them. And he ultimately shows that in about five or six chapters. When they come to the garden after him, he said, I'm the one you're looking for, not these guys. Let them go. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So Jesus is the bread of life, he's the light of the world, he's the gate, and he is indeed the good shepherd. Question? That's my French for the day. I, I, I didn't mean to sound harsh, but sometimes I get excited. Have you ever noticed that? I get kind of excited. Yes, darling. Pardon? Yeah.